appreciate the National Guard for performing that beautiful ceremony. Good afternoon. I'm Richard Prowse, Chairman of the Institutional Council, and uh, we're pleased to welcome you here today. I'm not going to say a lot uh, because there's some fine speakers that are going to be speaking to you later, but I would like to at least take this opportunity to tell you how much of a privilege I and the other members of the Institutional Council uh, feel that it is to be able to serve this great institution. Uh, raised to its present status under the good direction of President Nelson and now under the hands of, of our new President Kogo. It be appropriate at this time to, to recognize the many prestigious guests we have here today, and of course you're all prestigious guests, but we're not going to be able to mention them by name, but we do have with us today uh, presidents and representatives of the various colleges of the state. Uh, Governor Matheson uh, is not with us yet. I saw him coming in as we walk by. He'll be here. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Monson, Attorney General Hansen, and other state officials, city officials uh, headed by uh, Mayor Wilson, and many other representatives of municipal and county government. We also have with us uh, many friends and neighbors of, and, and family of President Kogel and former colleagues of his uh, from Weber State College and we're always happy to welcome the press. They, they're nice to have to, to observe the proceedings that we're having today. I'd like to tell you that following the convocation, uh, President Kogel and his immediate family will be in the foyer to meet friends and guests, and I know many of you want to, to come congratulate them. There will also be light uh, refreshment served in the College Center at one of the booths which has been sent up, uh, and a series of tables depicting the various institutional areas of the college are on display in the College Center in the main four hallways. I've walked through it already and have enjoyed that very much. One other matter of business, Dr. Bell We'll have to leave a little early. I haven't seen him as yet. He may, I'm sure he'll be coming, but he will have to be excused a little early. So we hope you'll enjoy this program today. I know it's a big day for Dr. Kogel, and it is for all of us, and so let's have a, a good time together, and, and we're grateful for this opportunity. I'd now like to introduce to you a doctor, or to Reverend uh, Donald Steiner, who is the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Ogden, is a very close personal friend of the Kogel family. And we'll ask him to offer the invocation to this meeting. Let us call upon God in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, with your gracious favor, we would ask that you look over this college, its students, faculty, administration, staff, all who care for it and strive to help it, to the end that knowledge may be increased and all good learning flourish. Protect them in danger, we pray, Enlighten them to study and learning. Kindle them in their imagination. Confirm them in usefulness. And as it commences a new era, as demonstrated by the inauguration of a new president, lead it in ways that are keeping with your will. Watch over its people and its activities Inspire all decisions affecting it. Preserve anyone and everyone connected with it from slothfulness and discouragement and pride. And equip them with joy and eagerness to seek the good. May your blessing and confirmation accompany Dr. Kogel and the proceedings in which we are about to engage. For we ask it in the name of your eternal love. Amen. I apologize for <clears throat> my late arrival and those of some of my colleagues. 
we do have a little uh, business up around the state capitol that keeps us occupied at this uh, time. And that accounts uh, partially for my not knowing that it was my time to participate here on the program. It is a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen and, and colleagues, to be here on this occasion and to participate in the inauguration of President Kogel. And on behalf of the presidents of the colleges and universities in the system, and all of your colleagues, uh, uh, President Kogel, we extend our congratulations and best wishes. We wish you a long, fruitful, and personally rewarding tenure as president of Utah Technical College. We surely commend the Board of Regents and their wise choice in selecting you as the new chief executive officer for this very outstanding institution. May the Kogel administration be known as one of aggressive, active concern for the the future of this college. And may this institution grow and, uh, and develop and respond in, in full measure to the important role to which it's been assigned by the State Board of Regents. And moreover, as Utah moves now into an era of, of considerable uh, uh, growth and uh, dynamic activity, as its industries, businesses, and agricultural enterprises progress, may Utah Technical College, under the direction of its able and talented new president, respond in full measure in preparing people to fill the destiny of our great state. Again, we salute you, President Kogel, and extend sincere congratulations to you upon your inauguration. Thank you very much. President Kogel, honored guests, students, faculty, friends of Utah Technical College, on behalf of the students, I extend greetings and welcome you here on this inauguration day. This is indeed a rare privilege and an honor for the associated students to be a part of the opening of a new era at Utah Technical College. It has been stimulating for us to tend, attend a college where a solid foundation and tradition of excellence has been set. Now, with the inauguration of President Kogel, there is a great anticipation for the new and innovative plans and programs on the horizon. As students, it is our expectation that these new plans and programs will meet our needs, as well as the needs of the college and the community, and that the lines of communication between the president and the students shall always be open. With this in mind, we offer our support and cooperation in advancing the character of Utah Technical College. President Kogel, on this your inauguration day, we express our confidence in your leadership and sincere best wishes for the future. Thank you. Honored guests, President Kogel. Ours is a government by committee, small groups of people working together to reach decisions. Reliance upon the group process as an instrument of decision making extends into nearly every facet of our lives. Our life is filled with communicating experiences within groups formed for widely different purposes. From the womb to the tomb, 
we are all engaged in group activity of one type or another. The group I represent today is the Classroom Teachers Association of Utah Technical College. This voluntary group of educators is formed so that we might eventually achieve stated purposes or goals to which we all subscribe. As we educate students' minds, we want them to know themselves well enough to know what it is that they like to do, what it is that fulfills them, and that leaves some sort of happiness within their hearts. Our challenge is to see the meshing of education and skill and vocation, and to harmonize all three into the orchestration of our students' lives. We are proud today to honor and acknowledge our new college leader. Leadership means many things to many people. To some, it is the lucky providence of being in the right place at the right time. To others, it is an inherent, almost divine complex of traits that sets one person apart from his peers. We are proud that we have just such a leader, and we are confident that he will keep members close together in a cohesive unit, maintain a high morale among the members, encourage a sociability that allows for freedom of expression, and help get the job done. Thank you. President Kogel, on behalf of the classified employees, I'm delighted to welcome you to UTC. We have noticed, as you explain your programs and work projects, that you use analogies and acronyms. Some of these are comparing UTC to an adolescent, or was that a teenage brat? <laughs> Naming your committee on development the codfish. I won't repeat some of the variations of that one. <laughs> Let me try an analogy comparing our organizational structure of UTC to parts of a bicycle wheel. The axle is the president. Because, of the, because the rest of the parts spin around something solid. The hub is the administrative officers, which are the inner support for the wheel and rot rotate around the axle. The spokes are the classified employees. They are connected to the hub, hub and give support to the major parts of the wheel, namely the rim, which is the faculty, and the tire, which is the student body. These two parts are most vital. If one, are, one is lacking, there's no use for the rest of the parts. The inner tube is the knowledge conveyed from both faculty and students. If there's enough hot air in that tube, the wheel can carry a lot of weight and can go for long distances. To have a useful wheel, all parts must function. If there are too many spokes, the hub cannot rotate. If there are missing spokes, the wheel becomes weak and can no longer support the weight. President Kogel, we spokes at UTC <laughs> have been noted for our ability to carry the weight. Our average tenure for classified employees is five years and we are full of energy. We, decide, we desire to succeed because we are professionals in our job as much as the professionals who teach. We have caught the vision, the vision being part of the biggest will in higher education. Kogel. 
on behalf of the Professional Association, I extend to you greetings and salutations on this occasion, the inauguration of the third president of Utah Technical College. The professional staff of this institution will support you and have confidence in you as you undertake the tremendous tasks in your new office. We approach the future with enthusiasm and spirit, some excitement, and President Kogel, we plan to enjoy the journey. For as Thoreau said, of what value is the destination if you don't enjoy the journey? With a firm conviction of the knowledge of the past and in the integrity of the present, we look toward the future. Victor Hugo quotes, if you recognize progress, call it tomorrow. Utah Technical College's accomplishments of yesterday now culminate in the progress of tomorrow. President Kogel, we commend and trust your strong leadership in that progress. We hope for, we aspire to, the greatness and goodness that can be ours here at Utah Technical College. Recently, a group of distinguished members of our college faculty were discussing the appropriate role of their constituents, and they concluded, it's the role of the faculty to think. It's the role of the president to speak. And it's the role of the deans to keep the faculty from speaking and the president from thinking. <laughs> There is perhaps no one here today who hasn't heard the old cliche, Rome wasn't built in a day. And those of us who have been affiliated with this great college for two decades or more at least have come to partially realize the significance of that statement. Rome wasn't built in a day, and Utah Technical College is no exception. But it has a very solid foundation. The first 30 years of the history of this college have now passed. The college started out with a undernourished babyhood. It was coddled through adolescence, and it was guided from a teenager to adulthood. And the result, the product is responding in a mature manner in the world of work. However, constant stimulation, new challenges, New goals and objectives are required to reach the pinnacle of success to which all of us here at this great college aspire. It's most appropriate, I think, to express our congratulations to the steering committee, the selection committee, who, along with the Board of Regents, contributed considerable patience, energy, and wisdom to the selection of Dr. Dale S. Kogel as the third president of Utah Technical College. We recognize Dr. Kogel to be a dedicated individual who possesses the leadership characteristics needed to perpetuate the goals and objectives of this outstanding institution. Those of us who have proceeded, preceded Dr. Kogel in his leadership role express our confidence in his ability to meet the challenges ahead in providing realistic education to the students who attend. And we express our confidence in his ability to meet the employment needs 
of Utah's expanding industrial community. And we express our confidence in his ability to work cooperatively and satisfactorily with the faculty, the regents, the staff, the governor, and our college community. And we express our confidence in his ability to continue the growth and development of this beautiful campus. And in expressing our confidence in his ability, we seal our pledge with the assurance of our loyalty and our support. President Kogel, our faith and prayers go with you in rich abundance during your administration of Utah Technical College at Salt Lake. <clears throat> President Kogel, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to be a part of this joyous occasion and to participate in these inauguration ceremonies. All of us are here today to extend our personal congratulations and our best wishes and to offer our support to President Kogel as he officially becomes president of this outstanding institution. We join here today to rededicate ourselves to the philosophy of education and to recommit ourselves to its excellence. This is also the time for us to reflect upon the role of the Utah Technical College at Salt Lake in the growth of the state of Utah as well. As we are all aware, our state is growing. And as Utah grows, so will Utah Technical College. To help absorb the demands of a rapidly expanding population and the rising demands of a burgeoning job market. Between 1970 and 1977, our population growth was two and one half times the national average, which made Utah during that period of time the seventh highest rate in the entire United States, and we're gaining. It has been anticipated that in the next 15 years, Utah can expect to be one of or perhaps the fastest growing market in the entire nation. We are not sitting back waiting for that growth to happen, but instead, we are anticipating it and planning for it, and in a way that will maximize positive effects and minimize the negative effects of growth. Utah Technical College is an integral part of that planning process. We have found in Utah that the need for vocational education is becoming more pronounced. In 1976, for example, 63% of the available new jobs were in the vocational education area. Students here are in the enviable position of learning skills which are needed now and in the future. The practical programming of studies assures this college's students of a meaningful place in Utah's future and Utah's growth. One of my priorities is for Utahns to have sufficient training opportunities to compete for higher skilled, better paying jobs as they develop within our own state. President Kogel shares that priority. One step toward achieving that goal is the new advisory council on designing vocational education for the future. President Kogel is chairman of that council subcommittee, which is creating a philosophy to guide our state's vocational education future. It would be inappropriate to talk about this college in only the present and the future tense. This institution has also had an admirable past. From its early beginnings, 
as a vocational center back in 1948, then housed in the Salt Lake Laundry Building, to this present location with six major buildings and a 103-acre campus. This faculty now serves more than 7,000 students, and enrollment is practically double that of the 1970-1971 school year. A major factor in this college's success has been its immediate former president, Jay Nelson. His farsighted guidance has placed this institution at the forefront of vocational education, and we thank him for it. <laughs> President Kogel is well equipped to continue this college's excellent historical integrity. And he is ready to lead Utah Technical College into a very exciting future. President Cogill is dedicated to helping each person realize his or her own full potential. And he is committed to the philosophy of vocational education. His credentials include serving as Dean of the School of Technology at Weber State College and as professor there. It was from that school he received an associate degree in 1953 and a bachelor's degree in metallurgy from our University of Utah in 1955 and his doctorate from Iowa State University in 1964. President Kogel, as you have already heard from your students, your faculty and staff, former President Nelson, Commissioner Ted Bell, all of us stand ready to assist you in whichever and whatever way we can. You have our high regard and you have our full support. The state of Utah salutes you as the new president of Utah Technical College at Salt Lake City and we wish you well in the months and the many years ahead. Thank you.
Governor Matheson, I know something of your schedule today. I don't think you need to worry very much about us Republicans looking over your shoulder. You don't stay in one place long enough. <laughs> <laughs> he has at least three days work today and he seems to be able to do it. Chairman Prowse and President Kogel, yesterday when I returned to town and found that Chairman Holbrook was out of town and that I was to pinch hit, I sort of felt it was like asking Mary Rose to pinch hit for Pete Rose. <laughs> it uh, just isn't quite the same. However, having such a compact and friendly and distinguished audience makes it much easier and really a pleasure. I wonder if I could ask uh, Mary Lou Kogel if she would please stand and just kind of let everyone look around at her. <laughs> You'll remember, Mrs. Kogel, that when the Board of Regents interviewed for this position, you were one of the people that were interviewed. Now that wasn't just a courtesy or a nicety. The Board of Regents long ago found that the matter of being the president of an institution is a team effort and we were mighty concerned about the team that was coming here and believe me we thought that uh, that uh, you were a splendid member of a team and uh, you have some very specific duties here uh, I'm sure you know what they are but if you aren't I would suggest that you get in touch with Afton uh, because hasn't she done such a wonderful job Afton Nelson <laughs> I'm not going to say that you have to uh, be as long-suffering as Afton because it's been 30 years that they've been here, and that is a long time. Now, Dr. Kogel, the program states that I'm to give you a charge. Uh, I hope you get a charge out of this. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think that your distinguished career as a tradesman and as a teacher and administrator point out that you have long followed Tolstoy's observation when he said, quote, the vocation of every man and woman is to serve other people. So my first charge would be that you continue your lifelong practice of serving others and that you, you frequently reflect on Tolstoy's statement. The vocation of every man and woman is to serve other people. The direction in which you take this presidency starts thousands of choice young people out on their destiny and will determine their entire lives. What an awesome responsibility. So I would charge you to keep in mind that your direction is eternal. That seems like an awesome responsibility to think of it, but it is absolute truth that your direction is eternal. Now, someone said, named Puddenhead, Puddenhead Wilson once said that uh, training is everything. The peach was once a bitter almond, and the cauliflower is nothing but cabbage with a college education. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I suppose it's uh, fair even in front of this august body. There are a few crimson robes in the 
congregation. It's fair to say that uh, Harvard University is looked to as being the epitome of university life, and uh, I, I read recently that the Board of Overseers at Harvard University issued in their annual report a statement that I want you to follow at Utah Technical College. Quote, The primary concern of American education today is not the development of the appreciation of the good life in young gentlemen born to the purple. Our purpose is to cultivate in the largest possible number of our future citizens an appreciation of both the responsibilities and the benefits which come to them because they are Americans and are free. And that, President Kogel, is my third charge to you, to remember at all times that your goal at this school is the same as the goal at Harvard University, to convince as many people as we can, to convince all of your students that the benefits which come to them is because they are Americans and are free. Now, your final charge, Dr. Kogel, is for you to continue, as the governor has said, a tremendous administration at this institution. My first connection here was in 1951 when, as a neophyte member of the legislature, I was pressured and pulled and tugged by some fellow named Jay Nelson to give a little bit more money to the laundry, and uh, we tried. <laughs> it makes me uh, almost weak to think of the years that uh, Jay Nelson has been doing this. 1948 or 49 is when he was first installed as uh, acting president, and he's been here ever since, and that is a tremendous career, as the governor has told you. And so I would charge you, Dr. Kogel, with following the, the work and the administration of what has gone before. There's much blood, sweat, and tears in these technical colleges, and we're all proud of them, we're proud of what they're doing, and we know that their, their goal is, to, or their, their role is to grow, and we are all going to help. This is certainly a most challenging charge. And now, would you please come up here with me? We have here a medallion that has been specially struck for this occasion, Dr. Kogo. It was designed by a member of the faculty, Grant Hewlett. It reflects the concept that men and women may learn in advance and advance their skills with both minds and hands. And there's a Latin phrase around the edge of the medal, and loosely translated, it says, industry and education are inseparable. Now, Dr. Dale S. Kogel, by the authority granted to the Utah State Board of Regents by the laws of the state of Utah, and acting for and on behalf of that board, I hereby declare you president of Utah Technical College at Salt Lake, and I confer upon you all of the authority and all of the privileges and all of the obligations that go with this important assignment. It's a real pleasure to do it, and I congratulate you and wish you well. Thank you to all of you for being here. You have honored Utah Technical College by your presence and by the participation of the people here. You have particularly honored me. At this point, it looks to me like the responsibility is far greater even than I had anticipated. That doesn't make me any less willing but certainly humbled by this greeting today. Thank you. I think before I talk about this institution with you today, that there are at least a couple things that need to be brought to your attention. 
In particular, I call your attention to the list of names who make up the inauguration committee for this college, and Brian Gardner, its chairman. I think they have done a superb job. I am quite pleased. I'm not sure whether Brian is, yes, Brian Gardner. I thank you for an excellent question. He said he's had so much fun doing this, he'd like to do it again, and I'm not sure how to interpret that. <laughs> <clears throat> Wait till next year, Brian. <laughs> Regent Peterson also asked that I introduce uh, some other members of my immediate family. Uh, you've seen one already, but I'd like my three daughters, Ida, Sarah, and Anna, to stand so you can recognize them, and my mother, who has come from... Virginia or Maryland to be with us today. I do have one other daughter who is uh, missing. Uh, Dave Gardner was so inconsiderate he did not cancel all classes today, so she's at the university suffering through an engineering program. <laughs> I would like to take just a few minutes today to talk to you about what I have seen at this college so far. Since uh, before the time that I agreed to be a candidate, that I uh, chose to be a candidate, I've been assessing this institution, matching it against uh, models that I understand, matching it against standards, which I think are very important. And of course, the further I go, the better the, the, they match the better this institution matches both standards of excellence and the models of what education could and ought to be. As I've gone through that assessment, I've discovered that there are certain insights which have come to me and they have turned out to be the kinds of challenges I'd like to share with you today. We've heard expressions of support today and I hope that we will continue to re receive that support and I'm going to let uh, people in on what we have to have in terms of support to get there. And I won't even talk about money after this simple reference now. <laughs> I'll also try to avoid uh, analogies today a little bit. Uh, Jim stopped just in time. I was sure he was going to talk about lubricating the axle before he got through. <clears throat> I view education as a developmental process, as a process of assisting individuals, enabling individuals to know more, to be more than they were before they started. And I consider that the function of an educational institution is to help people do that. You can't do it for them, but if we can be helpful in that process, if we can facilitate the process, then the institution is doing its job. This institution has chosen among all the potential aspects of an individual's growth to develop a phase which relates to job skills. Utah Technical College's uh, purpose is to facilitate the attainment of job skills for people in this community. One way to look at job skills has been expressed very well by a person named Patricia Cross, who has described the fact, has uh, explained to us in very clear terms, that every job requires skills relating to people, relating to things, and relating to ideas. As I have assessed this institution, I find that we are very, very good at helping people attain job skills relating to things and that we do a not bad job, although it clearly is not uh, as high a priority and there is not as much energy put into it, in helping people attain job skills related to ideas. Now, most institutions of higher education reverse that. They emphasize the training, the preparation in using ideas, understanding ideas, applying ideas, 
and only secondarily deal with things. In this institution, we have reversed that priority. However, our effectiveness so far, in my assessment, in developing job skills relating to people is very poor. It has been a minimal effort, and in some senses, I'm sure, an intentional oversight. And as I look at other institutions, I'm afraid most of those do the same thing. So challenge number one for us as an institution is to bring balance into our preparation of people for jobs, to indeed provide them with the, the opportunity and provide them with the ability to deal with people skills as well as with things and ideas. So challenge one is balance. Now, as soon as I say that, I know that some of my colleagues from the vocational education field will say, uh-oh, here we go, the liberal arts are climbing into vocational education again, sure enough, particularly when it's a fellow standing there with one of these funny things on the back, a PhD even. You certainly can't trust them. They will uh, infect the institution and we're in trouble. Remember, I'm talking about preparation of people skills, development of people skills related to jobs. And I'm perfectly happy to, to develop a balance which is represented in the descriptions that have been prepared for what levels of skills we need in, for each kind of job. We're a long way from that now. And it seems to me that once people have those skills and are able to function well, that we have universities here in the state and close to us which are much better qualified than we need to be or should be to continue that education and to provide those liberal arts, those hated liberal arts. I don't believe that this institution has very often looked at it that way, but indeed this institution concentrates on development if we consider it from a different aspect. And that's the aspect of the way people learn as they develop. A scholar named Piaget has, in, has presented a theory, developed a theory, a set of hypotheses which seem to work, which indicate that people learn in different ways as they develop. One of the stages in, those, in that learning development is called concrete operational. Now, we should know that very well here. It means learning best by doing. Learning best using concrete objects, concrete examples. This institution is already a superb institution for teaching people concretely. We need to continue that tradition. That indeed is the most appropriate way and most effective way to prepare people for job skills relating to things. And it seems to me that that is our principal emphasis here and should remain so, not forgetting, however, that you can't stop there. That in such preparation, if it is done properly and done well and done thoroughly, people are able to evolve in their learning development so that formal operational learning, learning by thinking first instead of doing first, becomes not only possible but an effective way to learn. So we must continue to teach hands-on, concretely, but we must continue that far enough with each of our students so that they have the option for formal learning by the time they leave us. Once they have formal learning, they can succeed in any kind of education, including our kind, if they so choose. One of the things we have ignored, however, is that a vast majority of our population, adult population, here in the Salt Lake Valley, learns new things best hands-on. I estimate that most of the people, most of the adults in our valley, ought to come here first. And so our challenge is to get the message out that we teach the way most people learn best to start, and we'll see to it that you learn useful things while you're here. So challenge number two is to get the message out and help the people find us so that they can gain this knowledge. Another perspective of a college is that it is an intellectual enterprise 
an intellectual enterprise which deals with development of knowledge, preservation of knowledge, and transmission of knowledge. Now, the emphasis in this institution has been on transmission of knowledge, teaching, helping people learn what's already known. And in fact, at first glance, and even at first inspection of this institution, it appeared to me that neither of the other two were being done at all, or at least not very well. We have a library, which is probably quite appropriate for this institution, but it certainly is small, and it certainly is frustrating because of its limits in size and limits in scope. So my first perception here was we teach well. The record is clear on that. We have done that very successfully. But that there is little knowledge development going on and not much more preservation of knowledge in this institution. Now, I carried that belief until I started prying into some of the master teachers here. When I discovered that, indeed, there is development of knowledge going on, and it's the kind of knowledge that we transmit, the difference is, compared with universities and institutions of that kind, that the knowledge development is not done by empirical research. That's become the hallmark of universities now. You must do research. You must do empirical research to develop knowledge. As a scientist and engineer, that's always been uh, very beneficial. Nearly anything I did counted as research, and they thought that was neat in those universities. But what I've discovered is that knowledge is being developed here by a process which is as old as universities. Our master teachers gather information from all sorts of sources, even research sometimes, but from all sorts of sources and from experience, and synthesize from that information new knowledge, new techniques, new ways of doing things to transmit to students. Now, that's not very obvious, and it's certainly not as uh, obvious to the public as large expenditures in time and energy in doing research, formal empirical research, but it's precisely the kind of research which has gone on in, believe it or not, the liberal arts in universities since they started several hundred years ago. So knowledge development is going on. Sometimes we're a little, little embarrassed by that, and most of the time, it's not very intentional. It's the process that is necessary to continue to be a master teacher. And furthermore, we have not recognized it appropriately nor encouraged it. So it seems to me that the third challenge is to make this knowledge development, which is going on, more intentional, to encourage it, to reward that kind of activity, so that the knowledge development in this institution increases rather than being almost accidental. As soon as I discovered that that's the way we're doing things here among the master teachers, it became obvious also why our preservation of knowledge is so limited. The kinds of knowledge which are being developed, which relate to techniques related to physical things in large part, don't go into books well at all. I don't know if you've tried to describe techniques of, uh, let's say, painting, since that's something that you can all relate to. I don't know if you've tried to describe that using words on a flat page. If you have, you've discovered that it's pretty inadequate, inadequate at best. And frankly, a, a uh, technique such as used in art is quite simple compared to many of the mechanical techniques used, which are used on three-dimensional objects, not two-dimensional, and which involve objects, devices, which have several subsystems interacting interdependently at all times. It takes too many pages to be worth writing down because after it's written down, nobody can follow it clear to the end and benefit from it. So it seems to me that a challenge to this institution is to take this new knowledge and to take the knowledge of techniques already present inside the institution 
and learn how to preserve it in a form which is transmittable to other people. Maybe we need to do audio, video, and holographic presentations or records of what these people know and what we are learning. That makes an entirely new kind of library, not one that I have, one that I have not found in any other institution. But if we're going to meet this demand, this need in our institution of preservation, we must meet the challenge of effective knowledge preservation in an entirely new medium. Another thing that I encountered in assessing this institution, one of the things I looked for was the priorities of the institution. As in any kind of growing institution, an early priority was to find people. And as I look at the people here and those who have been here for a long time, that was done very, very well. We have an excellent faculty, an excellent staff. I'm, I'm frankly astonished at, at how much better they are every time I get to know them. They are an excellent organization. The next thing after the priority of obtaining people to do the teaching came the priority to build facilities. I'm delighted you're here today. I hope you'll spend just long enough before you leave to see the rest of this facility. It is probably the best technical institution in the United States. It is well cared for and it is well used. Please wander around campus. It is uh, excellent. Once the faculty are set in a setting of this kind, a setting of excellence, the next thing they set as priorities is program. And I see the challenge here to shift them one more notch beyond priorities for program to priorities of students. It is my hope that I can lead this faculty, encourage this faculty to teach students instead of subjects. So that is a challenge. Finally, as I assess these resources, I have looked carefully at the capital resources. They're excellent. I've looked carefully at the fiscal resources. They're inadequate, grossly inadequate. I said I wouldn't do that. I, I, I apologize. <clears throat> then as I looked at the last of the important resources on this campus, but the most important, the people resources, I have discovered more of the very first quality people than any institution has a right to expect. Therefore, the last challenge that I see for myself and for uh, more for myself than for the rest of the institution is that of staying ahead so that I can indeed serve as a leader to the people of this institution. Thank you. I get a second shot. I'd like to thank you all for being here today, and, and I enjoyed this meeting, and I'm sure President Kogel did. That's my chance to convey the best wishes of the Institutional Council to you, President, and your family, and you can certainly expect full support from us, and we appreciate it, and a privilege to work with you. Elder Neil Maxwell will now offer the benediction. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for what has been said and what has been sung here today, and we ask for thy benediction upon these proceedings. We're grateful for President Kogel, a man of talent and of faith, 
and we would ask for thy blessings to attend him, that all of his experience that is relevant might be sharpened and brought to his mind and brought to bear in the affairs of this college. Will thou bless him and sustain him and his wife and family, that their precious times together may be times of renewal and reassurance. We're grateful again for the administration of President Nelson and all who have made this college uh, the first-rate institution that it is. Uh, Father, we're thankful also for the taxpayers who have so generously provided what is here. We pray that we might husband these and all resources that so come to us with the realization that times of affluence may not always be our lot. We pray that our gratitude to Thee may not be tied to plentitude, that we may remain close to Thee under all circumstances. Now, wilt Thou bless this college and the students who come here to find skills, but sometimes to find themselves, that both things might happen to their everlasting benefit and, and that the results might be turned to service towards a larger society. And finally, we ask for thy blessings to attend this nation, that we might yet rise to our destiny. And in troubled times, when we worry about being deprived of critical resources abroad, that we might not let ourselves be deprived of thy influence in our lives. Help us and sustain us as a nation, for we sense that so much of mankind's future rests upon our capacity to lead. And bless the youth who come here so to equip themselves, both vocationally and motivationally, that they might play their lot in that larger drama, all of which we thank thee for. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hoffman. I was associated with Dr. Hoffman at Weber State College back in 1967. Well, that uh, sounds a long time ago when you stop to think about it. And when I first met Dr. Hoffman, I was frightened to death of him. He just frightened me. Uh, every time I was called into his office, I shook in my shoes, and that fright turned to respect. As I became to, as I became better associated with him, and became uh, uh, worked with him better. So, Dr. Hoffman, I'm not frightened of you anymore. I respect you and, uh, and <laughs> treasure you as a friend. Dr. Hoffman graduated from the University of Heidelberg. He has had uh, taught s at several faculty institutions. Has has been on the faculty at several several institutions. Hearing that bell in the background makes me just a little bit nervous. Um, <laughs> being the director of the building, I wonder if that's the fire alarm or the burglar alarm or whatever it is. It must not be too serious. It's turned off. <laughs> it's not the fire alarm. Um, it has to be the burglar alarm. You'd, you would hear the fire alarm l much louder than that. Uh, where was I? <laughs> Yes, I'm still frightened, <laughs> but not of Dr. Hoffman, of you. And I shouldn't be frightened of you because uh, there are very, a lot of friends here this evening and uh, very, a lot of associates. Dr. Hoffman went to Weber State in 1967, where I was acquainted with him and served there as an academic vice president until 1973, when he became the academic vice president at Westminster College. And then in 1976, he became president of Westminster College. He is a member of several civic and professional groups here in Salt Lake City and has been a member of several uh, professional groups. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Helmut Hoffman. Thank you, Curtis. You need a little fright, I guess. President and Mrs. Kogel, members of the Institutional Council and the Board of Regents, faculty, staff, and students of the uh, Utah Technical College in Salt Lake City, 
friends and colleagues from higher education, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we have uh, assembled to celebrate a new beginning in the distinguished annals of this fine technical institution in Salt Lake City. <clears throat> to be asked to address this group on this occasion is indeed a pleasure and an honor for me, and I do hope that the selection of my words will match the spirit of the occasion. I promise Dr. Kogel that I would not spoil this splendid gathering by talking about Westminster's request for state support to the legislature. <laughs> <clears throat> With this promise in mind, uh, I would like to address this audience then with two areas of thought and reflection which I have chosen in uh, preparation for our gathering. I shall call these two areas thoughts and reflections on the role of technical education in our society and two thoughts and reflections on the task of the new president. Let us move our thoughts and reflections to our first area of this treatise. The specific role of technical education and the unique position of the Utah Technical Colleges. Five special conditions characterize this role. First, it is your challenge in these colleges and your assigned task to help our people maintain the highest possible standards of our technological society and to advance specific knowledge and skills to produce safety, health, and comfort for all of us in our places of work, in our houses, in our environment. Never before in the history of mankind has there been such a unique explosion of scientific and technological knowledge and its application to all facets of life as it has happened in our century. Unless skilled hands, observant eyes, and alert minds can continue to produce and maintain these marvels of life enhancement to which you and I have become inheritors, these bright stars of progress can become easily the gray ashes of a sad memory. The educational and the training program of the technical colleges contributes substantially to those human qualities which sustain all that we take for granted in our homes, in the health fields, in transportation and communication, in building construction and maintenance, in the electronic miracles of our time, and in our quest for the mineral riches of the world. The second realm of technical education could be described perhaps as follows. It is not enough to train people in the creation and maintenance of the products of our technological world. Above and beyond this assignment, the quest for a broad understanding of its principles and for a cultivation of an attitude of conservation, of wise use of resources and of reverence for all that is rendered to us is of equal importance to you who are in technical education. As a nation of people who are slowly and reluctantly turning from wasters to conservers, we have an obligation to imbue this attitude in all those we can reach in our educational institutions. Technological schools and universities share a primary responsibility for this change. A third thought like to advance could be described as follows. The American dream of the good life for all has become the world's aspiration for the good life of all. 
The intangibles of this dream lie in the realm of the spirit and in man's and women's hearts. The tangibles in the mass production of goods and in the transportation and distribution of these goods to the places of consumptions in free and not so free societies. In these latter areas, technical education is a sine qua non for the enrichment of the standard of living in the whole world. Let there be no doubts in the mind of the decision makers on the provision of resources for technical schools. If we starve those schools with underfunded budgets, all of us will pay for this philosophy of pipe dreams because we will not have the plumbers to fix the pipes of our intricate lives in the technical world. In Goethe's classical pedagogical work of the learning and wandering years of Wilhelm Meister, the great wise man from the 18th and 19th century emphasized thought and action, action and thought is the essence of all learning. Head and hands joined in unison the unison of practical and theoretical world in technical training meets this axiom like no other form of education can do. Here you face the supreme challenge of the technical college, namely to combine skill in how to do things with knowledge of why to do things and insights into the combination of the two. Last but not least, your role here is characterized by its unique adaptation to the very essence of our nature, which is so prevalent in almost 80% of our people. We human beings are, for the most part, practically minded, practically oriented. Our constitution is strongly oriented to our senses and their coordination with our precious tools, the, lim the limbs of our body. Very few people are really enthralled by the acquisition of te theoretical knowledge, and fewer yet apply such knowledge in the daily affairs of the lives. It is a false hierarchy of values which proclaims that the head is better than the hand, or that the teaching of philosophy is superior to the teaching of respiration theory. Both must have their place in our lives. But the balance in our proud institutions of higher learning has sometimes dangerously swung in the direction of the theoretical subjects. It is your distinct challenge, President Kogel, to articulate this point with forcefulness and with determination. This challenge to you leads me to the second part of my remarks which I have called some thoughts and reflections on the presidency. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of listening to my friend Dallin Oakes as he spoke at the inauguration of President Haven at Ricks College. One word by Dr. Oakes echoed like a fanfare through the inauguration speech as he challenged the new president. Lead, he said for a president must lead. I know of no better thought which epitomizes the essence of your new role, Dale. The president's first and foremost challenge is the exercise of leadership. Act rather than react. Use the favor of circumstances. Act prudently, but take risks rather than to please everybody. These are the mandates of leadership which the world expects from you, Dr. Kogel. Act wisely and consider the uh, consequences of your actions carefully. But act. Take a position and make your position known. For all those who are neutral are forever condemned to hell, as Dante told us in his Divine Comedy. When acting, of course, be sensitive to your constituencies, but never be the slave of any constituency. Respect your legislators, 
and the members of the Board of Regents or your institutional council who have entrusted this institution to you. They are men and women of goodwill who will render support, advice and counsel. Listen to them, but present your thoughts without fear of your job when you disagree with them. Your faculty and your staff deserve your respect, your kindness, and your considered appraisal of their requests. Don't play favorites and be fair to all with malice toward none and with charity for their concerns. Remember that you do not have to invent the Utah Technical College in Salt Lake. Those before you have done excellent work in the build-up of this splendid institution. Preserve what you have and enhance what you can become. While unique in mission and specialized in this assignment, your institution is also part of a larger system of higher education. You as a president can contribute substantially to the common welfare of this excellent system which the citizens of our state have created. Stand above petty jealousies between the institutions and strengthen all institutions by performing well in your own institution. Fight for Salt Lake Technical College, but cooperate with all in the system for the sake of all of higher education. Perhaps your most difficult task as president of this fine institution will be directed toward the education of the public on the importance of technical higher education. The technical colleges are latecomers on the educational scene. They must work hard, like Avis, for they deserve place in the sun. Apply yourself diligently to this task. You will need all the power of persuasion to change ingrained habits of thoughts about the value of your institution's contribution. And you will not necessarily be praised by your colleagues in the colleges and universities for your forthright and unashamed desire for a place in the sun. Let me conclude my remarks with thoughts and reflections on your first and perhaps most rewarding task as a president. Above all, remind yourself and those around you that quality service to the students is your primary task and your primary assignment. This is the supreme goal of all that you try to accomplish, to improve the educational program for your students, to create in them a sense of well-being and accomplishment, to foster their growth and understanding of the world around, and to lead them to the secrets in the universe as they encounter it in the work of their hands and their minds. For these tasks, Dale, you're well qualified May God's richest blessings strengthen you as you approach tomorrow's horizons. I've never had the fear that, uh, of Helmut Hoffman that Curtis expressed. I started with respect for Helmut Hoffman. But one of the things I quickly learned was that to make responses after he has uh, carefully thought through and presented uh, his thoughts is at best redundant. Therefore, the response which I'm called on to make tonight is one of thanks. I'll do the best I can to meet those criteria and to be successful as you have described it. I'm confident that the faculty, staff, and students here will help me, particularly now that they know what the rules are as you've defined them, uh, they'll see to it. <laughs> I am delighted uh, that you came to us tonight to make this presentation. 
I am delighted that all of you came to honor the Utah Technical College. We very much appreciate your presence here. I hope that your meal was as fine as mine and that you will indeed stay to visit with each other and uh, get better acquainted with us and each other and even dance, those of you who are not as decrepit as I. <laughs> Thank you. We'll have refreshments in the uh, meeting room just east of the dance area out in the foyer of this building. Again, our appreciation to each and every one of you for attending this evening. It is indeed an honor to have you here at Utah Technical College. Thank you and good night. <laughs>